Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Korea Society's Young Professionals Network webcast. My name is Yoon Park, Development Officer of the Korea Society. In part of our mission to promote the awareness, understanding, and cooperation between the people of the United States and Korea, the Society has launched the YPN series in 2011. So over the decade, a YPN has invited professional speakers from the diverse industries while creating a networking opportunities for young professionals. So today, as a third speaker of this year, we invited Yo Kwan, Senior Director of Production Management at Google. Yo is also widely known as our first Korean and Asian American winner of the CBS reality TV show, Survivor. Yul's incredible list of accomplishments has led him across a variety of major private and pub public companies, including Google, Facebook, Federal Communications Commission, US Senate, McKinsey, and PBS. He also returned to the Survivor last year to participate in the 40th season, uh, which is titled as, as Win Winners at War. You graduated from Stanford University and received his Juris Doctor from Yale Law School. Moderating today's event is Emmy-nominated and AP Journalism Award winner, Julie Cheng. Julie has more than 17 years of experience in journalism as an entertainment anchor for Good Day LA and Fox 11 Morning News and previous, previously at Good Day New York. Today's program is partnered with the Council of Korean Americans, a nonprofit organization seeking to advance the national voice and influence to the Korean American uh, community through collaboration and leadership development. And I hope you all enjoy today's program as you will share his unbelievable career and experiences on surviving in a professional world and what it means to be a Korean American in today's age. So if you're tuning in the YouTube channel, please like and subscribe on our page. And now please join me in welcoming you and Julie. Thank you. Yay, Yun, you don't need me for this. You could have done this interview. You were great, yay. Um, okay, so let's jump right to it. Uh, Yul, um, I had all these questions on how I wanted to begin, but your last email was so beautiful to me that I want to start with that. You know, my, sure. my, son is, my son is six years old and he always asks me, who do you love more, me or Lulu? <laughs> and I always tell him... <laughs> You know, do you love the moon more or the sun more? <laughs> both have different roles and we need both of it to thrive. And so, you know, you and I talk about, you know, basically in the Korean culture, like comparative rearing is real. You know, right. I grew up with my, my mom saying like, why can't you be more like Mrs. Kim's daughter who got into Harvard and then bought her a house or like, you know what I mean? And so, so you asked in this beautiful poignant email, please don't build me up to be something that is unattainable or uh, to make someone else feel less than. And you talked about like your, your mental struggles, your anxiety issues um, that you kind of kept hidden for so long, but, but all those things made you and built you to be who you are today. So can you reveal a little bit more about the, the struggles as opposed to just the achievements? Yeah, sure. And by the way, um, first of all, I apologize for unloading on you right before this interview. <laughs> I just, you know, I, uh, yeah, I mean, well, I'm happy to chat about it. And thank you for bringing that up. And again, thank you for, to the Career Society, you and for introducing me and Julie, thanks for, for doing this. I, I really, I'm a huge fan of your work. And so I, I would love to just learn as much about you as me. So love for this just to be kind of a dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I, it's funny. I, you know, when I'm invited to speak on these kind of things, um, you know, people will sort of go through my resume and and oftentimes kind of build me up in a way that, frankly, I'm, I've always been a little bit uncomfortable with um, because I, I think I sometimes am kind of portrayed as this like the superhuman person who went to these good schools and did all these things. And, and the reality is that I don't, that's not me. I don't feel that way. And you know, over time, I, I just started feeling more uncomfortable with it because I felt like I was being painted in a way that could be used to sort of articulate this unattainable standard that would be used to put even more pressure on kids. And, you know, I, it's something I really struggled with because when I was a kid, I just, 
I had so many challenges. I had so many problems. Um, and I can, I'm happy to go into the detail, but you know, the thing is I always felt very alone and I felt like I couldn't tell my parents and I couldn't tell other people around me because there was this perfect standard that I had to, you know, uh, hold up to. Like, I always felt like I had to be perfect with my parents. Um, I thought that if I told them about some of the things that I was struggling with, that they would be ashamed of me or they would, you know, either, you know, at least wouldn't understand it. At the very least would just really be ashamed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think within our community in the Korean American community, there's just a lot of pressure. There's obviously a lot of pressure on kids. There's a real stigma against mental health and psychological challenges. And, you know, I went through all that and I really struggled when I was growing up. And so I don't, I want people to understand and see that part of it because I felt that pressure when I was growing up, I still feel that pressure. And it took me a while for me to be okay with it and to be willing to accept who I was and to be open about these things with other people. And I wish I had been able to do that sooner. So, I mean, at the end of the day, what I really want is that people who are going through these challenges, you're not alone, you're, you're you know, I went through these as well. And it's okay to open up and, and try to find that support. Yeah, you know, you just never know what someone is going through in that, in that yeah. journey. Like, like what you see on Instagram, television, et cetera, it's just a snapshot. And yeah, like, exactly. Just to give you a little tiny picture of my struggle is I got diagnosed with a brain tumor. Yeah. My brain tumor. And um, the surgeon that was really ideal for the surgery was like a four month wait. And so for four wow. months, I knew I have this and I never shared it with anybody at work and I never mm. talked about it on air. And it, the messages I was getting, you know, oh my God, you got to interview Meryl Streep. You got to talk to, you know, mm. Brad Pitt, like, and just the the jealous emails that were, were rolled in. And I'm thinking, you have no idea. You have yeah. no idea that I'm just basically faking it because I have no idea if this thing in my head is cancerous or not. But yeah. I remember taking that moment thinking, never be jealous of somebody else because you just don't know their inner struggles yeah. that they're going through. So yeah. I love how candid you are with that. But now, now for the bragging part, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Julie, can I ask you a quick question? Because I, 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 I heard and read about your story, which I also think is just incredibly inspiring and courageous. But at the time, why, why did you feel like you couldn't share? Like, what was holding you back? Um, I think that if I shared it and it became bigger, it mm. would be that much bigger to fight. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of our upbringing was very similar, right? Like, everything I do... <laughs> Uh, but I mean, I, I've had a lot of therapy work to kind of undo it, but um, yeah. your whole goal as a Korean daughter is like to not bring shame upon your family. Right. And for some reason, I like blamed myself for the tumor. Yeah. It, it's just, you know, and I, I just, it made it feel that much realer and more sc like scarier to share yeah. it with people. Yeah. But now, I, I, now in hindsight, I think it just would have given me more support. I don't know. You yeah. Know? But I made uh, I it. I felt okay? the same way. I mean, the first. Oh, I mean, this is about yeah. you, Lord. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like we had very parallel experiences. And again, you know, I don't think it's coincidence. Like we, we grew up in kind of similar types of you know, traditions. I felt that way as well. Like I, I really didn't want to share. I, I felt like if I shared, it would make it real and I'd disappoint people and they would think less of me. In retrospect, I wish I'd shared earlier because it's almost like if there's this thing that you're afraid of people knowing about, once it's out there, it's out there. And it's, it's almost kind of like this burden had just lifted off my shoulders. Like, look, I mean, people might criticize me, might think of less of me, but it's out there at this point. And like, I don't have anything else to lose. And that for me, that was incredibly like liberating. I don't know yeah. if you felt that way as well. but That's another thing too. I didn't want to burden my family. Mm. You know, it's like yeah. they already worry so much about every little tiny thing. I right. just didn't want to add this to their plate. And you know yeah. what? I was right because eventually I'm like, I have to tell my mom. And her reaction was, I know people are going to be like, like up in arms about this. But if you know Korean parents, you know, this coming mm. from a place. When I told her, she goes, why would you do this to me? I already have oh. so many things I have to worry about. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, like I said, been continuing hard therapy for me. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Um, okay, so at Google, I think I've heard of the company. <laughs> you 
<laughs> your role there is senior director of production management. What is product that exactly? Mean? What do you exactly do there? Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm in product management. Um, basically, product managers in tech are the folks who build the actual products. So they they're the ones who try to define you know what is the next thing that we should be building. Working with a team of engineers and lots of other folks like designers and other cross functional partners. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I actually so I'm a, I work in product management, but my current role right now is I'm also the chief of staff to uh, Google's chief legal officer and the head of global affairs. So the person who oversees all the legal and policy challenges facing Google. So right now it's a pretty, it's a pretty, it's pretty busy. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in the world. Um, there's a lot of criticism of technology. There's a lot of questions around the role of technology, especially big tech in, in our society today. And so uh, my boss deals with all of that and I support him in dealing with all of these things. So it's a really, it's a really fascinating time. I mean, it, it like can be stressful. See, like I want to see the the uptick that happened in your inbox after everyone saw Social Dilemma. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, but like, I just want to know what happened in your household because it's just like I know you you don't want us to build you up like the superhuman, but it like when I read your bio, I was like, this is enough achievements for like forty. Well, to do people, but it's like one human. I mean, like it's like was it like a Navy SEAL training happening at home to be the super? Because it's just insane. Like Stanford, Yale Law. Like it just what happened in your house? Like what was the motto that was drilled into you about work mm. ethics and just achieving? Yeah. So it's funny because I think my personal journey is kind of mirrored by my professional journey. I, I, I think they all kind of start from the same thing. So, you know, my parents immigrated to this Korea, uh, to America from South Korea. Um, my parents were incredibly poor, uh, both at home and when they moved here. Uh, so I was born in Flushing, New York, and you know, we didn't grow up with money. We lived in kind of a bad neighborhood, just had a lot of bad memories of just a lot of mm. crime uh, experiencing our family. Um, and I grew up, you know, just really shy and introverted. Like I it felt like a very unstable environment in many ways. Like within my family, it felt like there was a lot of instability. You know, there was a lot of financial stress. We lived uh, in a rough neighborhood when I was growing up. I just remember getting beat up, getting bullied, uh, you know, and we just, it was a lot of bad memories from there. We eventually moved out to California when I was six. And even there, there were just a lot of challenges I felt like. I, I was struggling with uh, a lot of different things and they manifested themselves through like OCD, I had very severe OCD for much of my life. Um, I had deep social anxiety where I felt like anytime someone was looking at me, I would, I would essentially have a panic attack. I would just burst out in just intense sweating that I couldn't control. And it would literally just like drench my entire, all the clothes I was wearing. And that made me even more self-conscious about being other people. And, you know, there are a lot of bullying incidents. Um, you know, I lived in, I lived in Concord. My parents still live there. And it was a reasonably diverse neighborhood. There weren't a lot of Asian Americans there, but um, I just remember having a lot of memories where every Christmas, our Christmas slice would get smashed by some kids in our neighborhood. Uh, one day we woke up and our house had been teepeed. You know, people had thrown toilet paper all over our house. They'd spray painted on the sidewalk, Gook lives here with a giant arrow pointed towards our house. You know, a lot of that, that kind of stuff happened and it had, you know, experience a lot of racial taunts as well. Uh, there was one incident that happened in elementary school that really, really uh, caused a profound kind of change in my life that um, made things challenging. Uh, when I was in elementary school, there were a group of older boys who would make uh, and bully a lot of the younger kids, especially the, the colored kids. And, you know, there would be all sorts of things that they would do, like, you know, pushing us around, calling us names. Um, but one thing that they did that really affected me was they started hanging out in the bathroom and would try to attack the kids inside the bathroom. And they took to this practice of trying to grab the younger kids and holding them against the wall while the other kids would take turns urinating on them, right? <gasps> yeah, it was, it was pretty scary. So in my case, I just was so scared to go to the bathroom. Like I, I was afraid I might get attacked. Mm -hmm. So I just stopped going. I stopped going to the restroom. Um, and even if I tried, I was so anxious that I couldn't actually go to the bathroom. And even after this stopped, um, you know, eventually one of the boys 
started crying and the teachers got involved and they made it stop. The impact on me had been done, like the damage had been done. And for most of my life, and even to this day, I suffer from a condition called pariusis, pariusis, which is better known as shy bladder syndrome. And it's a condition where I can't go to the bathroom around other people. I can't go to public restrooms. And uh, when I was a kid, like I hid this from everybody, but it profoundly impacted my life. I couldn't go to parties or ball games or to the mall or to movies. Like I was terrified because I could never go to the bathroom. And I would literally spend my entire day trying to plan out my day so that I wouldn't have to be in a public space where I might have to go to the restroom. And this defined my life, I would say, for the next 20 years, even well into my adulthood, it was something I struggled with. You know, and so for me, I at some point realized that if I didn't start changing myself, if I lived in this perpetual state of fear, I was going to grow up and be just, you know, not happy. Like I'd be lonely. I wouldn't be able to live a normal life. And so I forgot sometime in my adolescence, um, I started. I came to the conclusion that I have to start changing myself because if I don't, it wasn't going to end in a good place. Mm-hmm. And so I started committing myself to a process of trying to change myself and to push myself out of my comfort zone a little bit every day. So I, I, was, I thought to myself, it, I can't change myself all at once. It's too hard. But maybe if I break it up into like little goals, little chunks, like today I'm going to raise my hand in class or today I'm going to talk to someone I, I haven't spoken to before. And if I just commit myself to that process, then maybe over time I could start pushing myself and, and growing. And I found that that was actually really helpful. Like I was able to make a little bit of progress every day and that started building a little bit more confidence. And then I would use that to be able to push myself even farther. Mm-hmm. I also realized that it's hard to change yourself by your just sheer willpower. And I realized that I could try to find support and help by joining organizations or joining teams. So I started playing sports. I took a drama class and these all scared the heck out of me. But you know, if you're part of a broader group and a community that can support you, then I found it easier to change in that environment. And then the other thing I found is like, you know, sometimes if you really want to change yourself, you have to put yourself in an environment that makes you uncomfortable, right? So I would deliberately start seeking out experiences that I knew scared me, but I felt like if I could learn to cope in that environment, I knew I would learn and I would grow and become a better person for it. So, and I found that in doing that, this process that I embarked on just to try to be a normal kid, to, to live a normal life, that also started being successful in helping me you know, in other respects, like both at school and in my professional career. So a lot, of my, a lot of my life has really been this constant effort to push myself out of my comfort zone, out of my, a little bit beyond my boundaries. And so I found that that has allowed me to do things that I wouldn't have thought I, would, I was capable of doing or brave enough to do when I was younger. And you know, for better or for worse, I've been able to have a, a really wonderful journey. I mean, I've had lots of up and downs in my career. I've had lots of setbacks, mm-hmm. but I've been able to do some things that I didn't think I would be able to do when I was a kid. And I feel like I'm better for it. Wow. Dude, you took that so extreme. You went on Survivor in like eight. No. Uh, <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, the lesson I take away from that is like, if you can just take one step, yeah. no matter how small, that small yeah. step might be the biggest step of your life. You just don't know it at that time. So, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I told myself it's not the outcome that matters, you know, in the short term. Like over time, you want to be able to change yourself. But any moment, like, you know, you just have to believe, even if you fail, if it doesn't work out, if you keep on at it, if you keep on doing this, and over time that you'll be able to see a lot of change. And I found that to be true in my life. And, uh, and when I see other people who have done the same thing, I've seen them be able to really grow and change as well. I love that you made your time available for us today to have these conversations because I think about how you have been so at the forefront of the conversations and the movement that's happening now. Hmm. I mean, I watched your four-part series on CNN and this was really? almost 10 years ago. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Trying to reveal what it is like to be Asian in America. And you know, cut to today, all those episodes are like ever green. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, that's so, so frustrating in a way, because I'm like, in 10 years, like, have we made any incremental improvement? Um, but then the hopeful part of me says, 
things are not getting worse. It's mm. just being revealed. Yeah. And in order for change to happen, it has to be revealed for that dismantling to happen. Mm. But thank you for being at the forefront of this uncomfortable conversation. And I just want to know, like, how does it feel that you have been talking about this for so long and <laughs> still? Uh, you know, I'm, I feel mixed. I, on one hand, I feel like we have made a lot of progress over the last 10 years. I mean, I, look, Julie, you've been at the forefront of this as well. I mean, you've been one of the play, trailblazers working as an Asian American in entertainment. You know, that is the, one of the areas where it's been hardest for us, right? For, for people in our community to be successful. And when I see how much change has happened in media on screen over the last 10 years, I'm, I'm incredibly hopeful. I mean, when I went on Survivor 14 years ago, it was, even back then, it was just incredibly hard to find anyone from our community who was just portrayed as a normal person, just a regular American, as opposed to being defined by the stereotypes. Um, you know, fast forward to today, just even in the last five years, there's been an explosion of Asian American talent on television and movies and news and, and all sorts of different media. And I've been incredibly hopeful as a result of that. You know, like one of my kids, I have two girls who are eight and 10. You know, they live, they're looking at a different world than the one that I grew up in. When I grew up, you know, it was like, I don't know, my, my role model was Big Bird because it was like, it was yellow. I don't know, there weren't any other role models on television. I was like, he's big, he's yellow, he's cool. Um, you know, but my kids now, they watch television and there's so many movies, there's so many different, you know, and I, I do think that, uh, oh, um, sorry, my screenshot came out. Representation totally matters. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think the fact that I didn't see a lot of role models and people that I could empathize with when I was a kid really did influence me. It defined the way that I looked at myself, my relationships with other people. And it contributed to the sense of being other and not fitting in and not thinking that I could be a leader within, you know, my community or other communities. When my girls are looking at television now, I mean, they see so many different possibilities and that makes me incredibly hopeful. Mm. You know, that said, as you pointed out though, like, yeah, I mean, the ugliness that we're seeing today is shocking to me. And I, I don't think this is something that happened. I think to your point, it's something that's been revealed. It's been underneath there, but I feel like, you know, the events of that, of the last, I don't know, several years have now somehow given people a sense of license that it's okay, that yeah. it's all right, that it's like normal to be able to express these types of views and to conduct behavior or conduct themselves in a way that really just shouldn't be appropriate. So I also worry about that because my kids see that and I worry about the, the ugliness that they're seeing as they grow up. Yeah. Well, you know, Brene Brown, who talks a lot about shame, she's, she's a wonderful researcher and she just talks about how, you know, dehumanization starts with language. And yeah. we think about the words that have been used by leaders in the last few years. Yeah. And we are seeing that at play. You know, yeah. those things have consequences. Yeah. And so um, that's why later today, you're going to do your part, right? You're doing another um, virtual event, and then you'll also be hosting a protest on Sunday, right? A peaceful yeah. protest. Yeah. So. yeah, I, you know, my, my wife uh, has been really kind of spearheading this. I, I've obviously been supporting, but we want to be able to show our kids that, that we want to do, act, we want to stand up for ourselves, that it's okay to peacefully protest. So yeah, we're organizing a, among a group of friends and others, uh, basically a peaceful walk, a march with their families. Mm -hmm. And because we want to be able to show our kids that like it, there is a way to express yourself and show solidarity that, that is impactful. Yeah. So you, when you, when you were going to schools like Stanford and Yale, so what, how much of that was innate in you? Like, I want to be at these places. I want to be studying this way versus did you feel the pressure at home? Oh, tons of pressure. Yeah. I, I very much, you know, I think for a lot of Korean American kids they grow up feeling that their parents' love is conditional, right? Like totally. if you get an A, your parents yeah. will love you. If you don't yeah. get an A, then you know the love isn't there. And so for me, I think a lot of it was just this anxiety and this desire for acceptance and not to disappoint my parents. So, you know, in a weird way, I feel like it was and again, this is one reason why I talk about this, because I felt like in many ways I didn't love to learn. Right. It wasn't like I went to school because I could enjoy the inherent process of learning these different things. It was always a stressful, like I, it's, you know, I have to be good enough 
to not disappoint my parents. And I realized that like, you know, I wish that wasn't always the case because I, I think I still would have done well in school, but yeah. I wish I learned to love to learn how to learn, how, you know, as opposed mm-hmm. to being driven by fear and negative reinforcement. Yeah, no, um, I, as a parent, I'm trying to be very cognizant of that. Yeah. Why does everything have to have an end goal? Do you yeah. know what I mean? And, you know, um, a psychiatrist was studying mass murderers mm-hmm. and um, what he found with so many of these, these really um, violent people were they were denied free play as kids. Really? Yeah, and, and he talks about how since 1950, we haven't really let our kids play properly. Mm. Like they don't have to have a finished arts and crafts project. They, there shouldn't be a time constraint. There should be never a way you can or cannot play right. Um, yeah. We've now just kind of boxed it all in so there's no actual free play. And so yeah. I'm trying to be mindful, which is hard to do coming from, you know, Korean parents <laughs> <laughs> of not to be achievement and or end goal oriented. Yeah. Um, is, is that some of what you're trying to do with your kind of latest project around the uh, 948? Yeah. Like, I, I'd love to learn more about that. I've, heard, I've obviously heard and read yeah. about it, but I'd love to. So for those hear of you it watching, words. it's like random 940 is um, it's not that random. It's my new uh, docu series that I'm self producing, and it's because I counted that there's 940 weekends from the time they're born until they are off to college if they want to yeah. go to college, but basically until they're adults. And I say weekends, it's actually 940 weeks, but let's be honest, Monday through Friday, a lot of the time (laughs) in our own thing. So, you know, you have those two days to really be attuned. And what I hear from every parent is it went by so fast. And so I started researching, are there actual tools and solutions where you can kind of give time shape Mm -hmm. um, so we don't feel like we missed it all, you know? Um, And I think this pandemic, if there's one lesson I've learned is that we all crave deep connection, deep meaningful connection. And um, somehow we've lost our way, you know? And so um, hopefully with the show, I'll tell you, follow me at truly Julie Chang on Instagram and I'll keep you guys posted on the upcoming episodes, but thank you for asking about that. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see it. And the the reason I love just the idea, even seeing the number 940, it makes me aware of the fact that I don't have that much time with my girls, you know, and, and it's something that I am sure all parents struggle with is, you know, on one hand, I feel like I'm working hard because I want to be able to provide a good life for them. Like I, you know, my, I struggled when I was a kid, my, you know, just, there were so many financial pressures and I don't want my kids to face that. At the same time, I worry that I'm going to wake up one day like, all right, kids, I'm ready to hang out. And they're like, wait a sec, <laughs> one, they don't want to hang out with me. They want to hang out with their friends yeah. and there's not much time left. So I, I love the idea of like, seeing this as like a countdown and almost like you have this much time with them to to shape them and help them be the right person and to show them you love them and how are you going to use that time so i love that concept and you have a preteen so you know it's far fewer than 9 40. like they yeah. want to start hanging out with you and they want to hang out with their friends all the time soon enough you know yeah and for yeah. the divorced parents you cut 9 40 in half yeah. So uh, it's really meaningful time at that point. Um, but here, I don't want any parents to have like heart palpitations. I'll take the pressure off. Uh, based on the research so <laughs> far, they say five minutes of um, undistracted attunement means more than giving them three hours where you're just kind of not in it. So you can, you know, all of us have have five minutes we can just zero in, put our phones away, zero in mm. on our little ones or big ones or any human being. Um, that, that, that goes even farther than like four hours of diluted multitasking time. So there's that little nugget for you. That makes me hopeful because I, I you know, again, I, I've been so crushed at work that I don't feel like in aggregate, I spend nearly as much time with my kids. But when I do try to spend time with them, I, I want, I feel like I, hopefully I'm showing them how much I love them yeah. and value them. And I'm hoping that will be more impactful than having a lot of time with them where I'm just kind of like tuned out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think you're, you're, I mean, you you excel everywhere. So like, I, I have a pretty, pretty good sense. Of pretty <laughs> attuned I don't know. If you ask my wife, I don't know if she gives us <laughs> an answer. But hopefully okay. she's not home right now. 
So this is where it gets crazy. You've done law, you've done consulting, you won a survivor, you hosted your own CNN series. And then like, this is the part where I'm like, I need to know everything about this. You were an adjunct instructor for the FBI. Like, oh, yeah. what does that mean? Uh, cool. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, that was so much fun. So what happened was, uh, and it's kind of a funny story. After I won Survivor, um, at some point, what happened? After I won, I got a call from someone from the FBI and it totally freaked me out. I was like, you know, because, uh, you know, the first guy who won Survivor went to jail for four years, I think, for tax evasion because he didn't report his million dollars. And I'm pretty sure, like, I got, I got audited by the IRS after I won. I'm pretty sure they audit, like, most people who win, like, a reality show, right? Yeah. Um, so... I had gone through the audit, which was not fun. And I got this call from the FBI and I was freaking out. I was like, no, 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 I swear to God, I paid my taxes. Like, you know, really, everything's good. You know, uh, and it was that. He, basically, it was a an instructor at the FBI Academy and they were teaching uh, FBI agents on a course for their counterintelligence program on how to recruit human informants and how to build trust and, and rapport with people in order to get information from them. So it was fascinating because you know the deeper I got into it, basically what was happening was that the FBI had for most of its existence been a traditional law enforcement agency. So the idea is like, you know, if you want to get information, you grab the bad guy, you interrogate them, you apply maximum leverage, and you just scare them to get the information that you need. And then the other thing was that there was this, they had what was called a gun carrying culture. Like it was a type A sort of alpha male type culture where there's both self-selection, the people who want to become FBI agents are the people who want to just kind of like get the bad guys and kick butt. And then yeah. even internally, the culture tended to reinforce that. Like it was a very kind of, you want to be tough. You want to be locked on. You didn't really want to show vulnerability. And what they're finding was that in a post 9-11 world, that was actually not the right mode of engagement to actually get information from people. Because mm -hmm. in a more counterintelligence type world, you don't always know who the bad guys are. You don't always know where the threats are coming from. And what you really want to do is to be able to build trusted relationships with people so that they trust you. And, and FBI agents were having a tough time doing that because they were taught to be tough. Yeah. And so uh, the course was really around uh, trying to teach a lot of these agents to use some of their softer skills. Like how do you express vulnerability? How do you build rapport with people so they trust you? And they were using Survivor as a case study. <laughs> so you know, you can you can give a lecture on how to wow. build trust. You can give a lecture on how to engage with people, but if you can actually see it on television, if you can see people engaging and interacting, it's just, it's much more effective. And so well, the great thing about Survivor is like- If you do the casting, it is a microcosm of yes. the different extreme personalities that exist yeah. in the world. So that yeah. is really good little lab rat yeah. <laughs> to look study. It is, it is. Yeah. It is you know, if, if you wanted to run a social experiment, it would cost a ton, like an enormous amount of money if you want to do it at scale. But the great thing about Survivor is like everything's, this is all authentic. Like, you know, people actually fight with each other or build trust and it's all on television. So you can, you can talk about the abstract theory of building trust and they can actually show it through some of these actual engagements. And so they're using my season to illustrate some of these principles. And, and I guess implicitly I ended up using some of the, uh, techniques that they were trying to teach. And so basically I got a call saying, hey, can you come in and kind of walk us through how you won and how you engage with people? And I was like, yeah, sure. Sounds like fun. And, and like, it went really well, like, and they liked it. So they kept on inviting me back and then it just became a regular thing. So I started what going to the FBI Academy. What is the you one, two, three step in engaging people? Uh, so the basic, I don't know, some of the basic things are you know, you want to be able to express vulnerability, right? Like you want to be able to get people to feel that you're trusting them and so that they can trust you. You never want to tell people what to do. People don't like being told, you know? What you want to do is to be a partner and you want them to feel like you're giving them good advice, like real advice, so that they come to trust you more and they come to you to give you information because they want good advice in return. Yeah. So I think those are some of the things that you, you want to... You know, it's and also basic things like you want to mirror the person's body language, right? Like you want to try to show this emotional resonance between what they're saying, what you're saying, kind of show that your underlying values are aligned, build that trust, and then make it a reciprocal thing. You know, like I, I trust you, you trust me, and you kind of build from that.
Wow. Okay. So you want to hear something funny? The immediate yeah. Korean thought in my head comes. I'm like, oh, do not go. I'm like, that's where my thoughts <laughs> are going for like a bunch of FBI guys watching Survivor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to translate for the non-korean speakers i'm like oh my god that's like what a waste of my money my tax money <laughs> the korean always thinking about uh, dollars um it was okay. good though i i it really it ended up being as i understand it, one of the highest rated programs or courses that they had um yeah, yeah it, was, it was fun because you really kind of like break down like exactly like i would show like different pieces of what happened on on the show and then kind of talk about the context and why i said things and why i did things a certain way and and they're really smart people they asked like great questions so it was a lot of fun dude my husband tried to be in the fbi i didn't make it he's still salty till this day so <laughs> the fact that you got to work with them he's like oh, <laughs> um okay has it been overall you think helpful or hurtful to be korean american you know it really i guess it depends on in what context like yeah is it helpful in terms of like just pure career mm -hmm. i would say mm, it's mixed you know I, I think the model minority myth is very real i think there's a lot of implicit bias I, I'll, I'll be honest everywhere i've worked i have felt it you know there's this thing called the bamboo ceiling uh which is real it's in every you know, organization, every field I've worked in. The bamboo ceiling, I'm guessing everyone has heard about it, is basically this idea that uh, there are a lot of Asian Americans, and this is very true for Korean Americans, who work in all of these kind of different fields, whether it's law or finance, tech, you know, any, any place, uh, even in entertainment. But when you get into more senior levels of the organization, the representation really tapers off, right? So like in tech, for example, it's not unusual to find 40% of the workforce being Asian American. But as you get more and more senior in that organization, the percentage gets much, much lower. And I think that's a very real thing. And I think for me, you know, it has impacted my career. Like I can point to specific things where, or experiences where I think it, it had a tangible impact. Mm -hmm. So I would say in terms of like, you know, just pure career advancement, it, it is a tax. It, I think it has been a headwind that I've, I and pretty much everyone else I know has really struggled with. But if you look at it in terms of, do I feel like it's made me a better person? You know, do I feel like I've learned and in the kind of arc of my career, my, 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 my own life, has it enriched me? I would say, yeah, absolutely. Like, even though it's been harder in some respects, it's made me more empathetic. It's made me more self-aware. It's made me struggle in a way that I think ultimately made me a better person, you know? Yeah. And I do think it's helped me in my career in that sense, because I feel like I can you know, empathize with, I mean, just even the team that I manage or teams that I've managed in the past, like, because I've often felt marginalized and I felt like I was on the outside, mm -hmm. I've learned to be much more cognizant and aware of the dynamics. Like in a meeting, do the same people, you know, who are typically white dominate the conversation, talk over and over again. And, and, and I'm aware of the fact that, hey, other people aren't having a voice in this discussion and trying to shift them and call on them so that we have a much better kind of representation and ultimately a much better discussion and better team. So I, I do think it's helped me in those respects. I think I'm a better manager and leader because I've been Korean American and because I've had these struggles. So yeah. I, again, I think it's kind of a mixed, mixed thing. It gives you dimension. Do you know what I yeah. mean? It makes you more relatable in the sense than say if you had just cush ride all the way to the top. Yeah. Um, I think in your Asian, um, Asian revealed Asian reporting for CNN, um, the stat during that time, 10 years ago, was like 50% of Asian Americans go to college, but less than 1% are in the, in the top executive roles. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if those numbers are pretty much the same. You know? uh, I don't know the exact numbers lately. The last time I took a hard look at this stuff was just a couple of years ago. But it's still the basic story is. And you the same. also see it in TV where we're never the main face. We're yeah. the auxiliary reporters, yeah. you know. Of course. We're the sidekicks. Um, and and the energy I always got is like you're lucky to have a seat at all. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. But um, if I had to say from my experience, like, you, you know, I just never wake up in the morning and forget that I'm a woman, right? I never mm -hmm. wake up and forget that I'm Asian. 
Right. And so, you know, very earlier on, I realized, okay, I have to be strategically Asian. And, <laughs> and so you can master being strategically Asian. I don't know if you about that. Um, I, you can survive it better, I think. Because um, there are okay, different as well. I'd love to, I'd love to hear a more about your experience because I mean again listen I've, I've had a taste of being in the entertainment world or yeah. kind of media world I mean this is you've lived it your career has been this have you seen things change have they gotten better and what have you had to do to be strategically Asian like what are the things that have allowed you to continue finding success you know like tv industry and entertainment industry in general is so short-sighted and such short memory <laughs> span yeah you know, it's like the Time's Up movement happened and Oscar So White has happened and you see like the tension and things changing. And then like two, three years later, changes right back. Hmm. You know what I mean? And so yeah. um, it's disappointing, but I think the beauty of social media now being so prevalent is that we now have the power to keep these conversations going. Yeah. And yeah. it is our obligation, you know? I think a lot of the times um, you're, you, me, I, a lot of people would say like, we made it, right? For the people who have made it, it is like our uh, duty to give yeah. our time to have these type of conversations. Yeah. Because Absolutely. Um, otherwise we'll just be a trend. Do you know what I mean? We'll be this weird yeah. cycle where everyone talks about Asian lives matter for one second and then it's like onto the next. And so, uh, I'm glad that we're having this conversation. Okay, yeah, I have what, a question. Um, sure. Okay, like 15, 20 years ago, I started getting phone calls from Korea. And they were saying that, you know, we really want to start actively trying to cross over Korean pop culture. <laughs> if we paid your way, we brought you here, and you just shot some feature pieces with a bunch of Korean pop stars, like would you? <laughs> and I remember thinking, like, I'm like, I don't want to break it to these people, but there's like no way Korean pop music is <laughs> US in my lifetime. But they're paying for my trip, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll go. So I went. I interviewed Rain. Um, I interviewed all these. I met Rain too. <laughs> I remember I met him at a restaurant and yeah, yeah it was so embarrassing. Yeah, I thought he was like, a waiter. <laughs> a ninja assassin movie as well. They were pushing him so hard to cross over. Yeah. Anyway, they did it. Our people did it. You know what I mean? Like I try to explain to people, I'm like, K-pop is what it is today is because it's like a government subsidized. <laughs> really? Yeah. Like we yeah. don't have any natural resources we can import out of Korea. So they like yeah. brilliantly thought of a way to import entertainment and like yeah. BTS. I mean, you oh, know, Blackpink, my girls Black love Blackpink. Black 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 like, oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's yeah. happening. How yeah. do you feel about, I guess, like the representation of Korea through K-pop? Cause I do even think they represent the correct Korea. Yeah, you know, it's, hmm. you know, I'm, I'm supportive of it. I'm in favor of it. Like, you know, I, so just another kind of dimension to this is like, you know, where there were, uh, you know, I got asked about this thing around, have you seen Bling Empire? Bling oh, Empire on Netflix. It's a train wreck that I can't stop looking at. Yeah, okay. So, so, <laughs> so there, were, you know, I remember there were like things like this that, um, for me, I, I've, my own, perception of these types of things has changed over time. I, I used to think, and this is when I was, especially when I was back on Survivor, like, look, we get so few opportunities to get visibility in front of mainstream America. And like, let's not waste that. Like, so for me, I very much wanted to try to portray like a positive image uh, when I was on on Survivor, like, because there's so many negative images. You're the queen um, Claire by reputation. Yeah. You're the queen Claire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I shampoo it every day, you know? um, but I, I just, uh, I, I've now taken kind of a longer term view of things. I think for the most part, it's okay. Like, yeah. I don't think there has to be a perfect representation. I'm, like, as long as I see a diversity of representations, because I mean, the reality is that like, we are not perfect. I mean, they're good, they're bad. As long as you get to see 
different facets of us, mm. I think that's okay because it just makes you seem more human, right? Mm. And I also think that the more you can just get used to seeing people who look like us on television or on some sort of screen, it just normalizes it. And that will provide more opportunities for other people. So I'm generally in favor of it. Like I, you know, is K-pop, is it, is, is it artificial? Is it manufactured? Yeah, of course. Mm. But at the end of the day, it's kind of cool that like my girls who are really into Blackpink have friends at school who are white who think blank pick is cool. I'm like, that's that's yeah. neat. Like we need more of those. So I honestly never thought I'd see it in my lifetime. So hats off to them. It worked. Yeah. Whatever plant I mean. <laughs> I, should I take the credit? It was my reporting. It was the <laughs> feature pieces I did 20 years ago. <laughs> that's amazing. That's incredible. Wow. <laughs> um, I want to give our viewers some tangible advice. Um, I find that. I find like routines of highly successful people very fascinating. Hmm. So, like what is the first three things you do in the morning? What's oh. like, do you have a routine of do you have like, good habits you can share with us? I'm, I'm not a great example. I, I, for the last few years, I've been working so much that, you know, typically first thing I do is I wake up, you know, I check my, my phone to see all the emails that I need to get back to and my heart's kind of racing. It, it is not great. One thing that I do though, that has been helpful. Now, many years ago, I learned how to meditate. I took a course on transcendental meditation with my wife and my, my best friend at the time. And um, I did it for my friend who was dealing with a lot of mental health issues at the time. And I thought it might be a way for him to learn this mechanism that allows him to calm his anxiety and, and that help him. And it, and it did. Yeah. This is a safe place. You don't have to say friend. We got you. We got you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. uh -huh. um, so I, I found that being able to meditate can really help. So I, I, I try, and I'm not always successful, but I, if I can, I try to meditate in the morning. Um, and that, that really does help because it, it helps just reset your mind. It helps you get out of this, these, cycles of thinking, these tracks of thinking where you just are stuck in a kind of a rut or a circle. So that's the, I mean, I've generally found, look, if you can exercise, get enough sleep and meditate, that's like the holy grail. If you can do all three of those, yeah. that's amazing. But there've been like, I don't know, maybe a day in the last 20 years where I had the time to do all three. Yeah. So, you know, usually you just have to optimize. What I found is that I have to get at least some minimal amount of sleep. If I get below that, then my day is just kind of wrecked. Yeah. If I get that minimal amount, then between exercising and meditating, I don't know, it's a close call. I'd probably optimize for, for exercising because at least you get that physical kind of boost as well. Mm -hmm. But I found meditation to be really helpful, especially during the times that I'm most stressed out. Mm -hmm. So that would be my, my one practical piece of advice. So this, this, this is a big deal in the sense it's YPN's 10th anniversary, Young Professional mm -hmm. Network. Um, with the, with the focus on the word young, your if you could give your fifteen-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, that's a good one. I think if I could go back in time and give myself a message, it would be one. Uh, one, I would say. Don't be so scared. It's going to be okay. It's going to work out all right. And two, uh, don't be afraid to open up and share and let people know what you're going through. Mm -hmm. That's what I think I would say. Because I think, I, I mean, eventually I think I got there, but I think I made it harder on myself because I was so afraid to let people know what I was going through yeah. and get help. I think a lot of Korean or Asian kids in general get the twofold, right? You get the pressure to achieve yeah. and then you get the pressure to do it fast. Yeah. So, you know, the lack of patience for you to like take your time and then yeah. enormous amount of weight to be bigger than, you know, whatever the next kid they're comparing you to at home <laughs> yeah. um, is, is, um, it's almost impossible to do a research on like what kind of repercussions that has, but I yeah. can't imagine it's good. Um, and just yeah. because you end up going to a good school and having a good job, you know, that's not what all life measures up to be. Um, yeah. But it's unfortunate that we don't measure the other stuff, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So COVID landscape. 
Um, we talked a little bit about the horrific things we've seen happening in the Asian community. Can you share with us um, something that's really hit close to home for you? Something that happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so this wave of anti-Asian hate, uh, obviously just incredibly distressing, uh, something I've been following closely. It's something that's hit close to home for me. Um, so my mom, a few weeks ago, was driving in her car. Um, you know, this is where we grew up in. I mean, she's been there for, I don't know, like 30, 40 years now. But she was driving around in her car, and then somehow she kind of took a wrong turn and kind of like kind of got a little bit stuck, and then she had to try to back up. And then uh, a white man in a truck saw her, and he deliberately blocked her so she couldn't move. And so she, you know, was like honking a horn, trying to get out, and she just he wouldn't move. So she got out of her car and she went to him and she's like, please, sir, can you move your car so I can leave? And he's like, no, I'm not gonna move. You can't make me move, you know, while you're here. And she was like, please, can you just let me go? Like, I, I would like to go. This was, I didn't, you know, I made a mistake and he just would not move. So my mom was really scared. Like, well, she was pissed. My mom is a fiery person. And, but she was thinking about calling the police and then she was afraid to because she was worried that if she called the police that it might provoke him and he might, try to hurt her. So she just didn't know what to do. So she had sat in her car and waited for like 20 minutes until eventually, eventually, eventually he moved on. So that was just like, I mean, when I heard that, it just, ugh, my mom is 76 years old and I don't understand. I mean, so many of the attacks have been against the people who are the most vulnerable, you know, these elderly, including women. I just don't get it. I'm like- The overall mentality of the people who like literally don't want to be a burden. Yeah. You know, they don't want to be a burden on anyone and they're the ones being attacked. So it's like, yeah, it's it, it, and what yeah. my heart is, they say it's, you know, 4,000 cases of hate crime have been reported in the past year. But like you said, how many of them don't go reported? Yeah, I right? would say the vast majority of them, yeah. So it, the 4,000 is such an underestimate of what is actually happening because whether it's a language barrier or just the overall shame or overall need to not be a burden on anybody, nobody's reporting them, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I hope that somehow we can keep the beautiful things about our culture, but also adapt Asians and Koreans and our people to sort of make that shift to take up more space. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think otherwise we're, we're, we're just going to keep being in this position. Yeah. I, you know, one thing that I, again, I, I wish this was not happening. Uh, one thing that does make me feel more gratified though, mm -hmm. is, I mean, our community is coming together. Like I, I remember, um, you know, back in the day after survivor, the Virginia tech massacre happened mm -hmm. and, you know, there was just an absence of voices who can speak for the community you know like it was just i remember at that point in time the i think the korean ambassador to the united states from korea actually kind of came out and spoke on behalf of the korean people but it was because of this void of any voices that could really fill in that debate and kind of represent us and what i'm seeing now the response across the country i've been really happy to see because i think it's actually forced us to come together to have more of an active voice and advocate for ourselves and make ourselves visible in a way that I don't think has happened before. And I'm hopeful to your point that this is just not a trend. We can kind of build on this both as a community to work together, support each other, but also to advocate for, for better change. So, so I don't know. I mean, I, I wish this wasn't happening. It's incredibly distressing. At the end of the day though, I hope this actually is something that we can learn and grow from and ultimately makes it stronger. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question from me. <laughs> Um, when I look at your career path, I'm thinking, oh my God, I just love how you kept it so interesting. Like we didn't even get to the part that you own like a frozen yogurt chain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I oh, made up consulting, my career. Payment. Like, is this all part of you still like stretching yourself to be uncomfortable? Uh, the, the frozen yogurt thing was not not stretching myself it was more <laughs> i really liked frozen yogurt and like i didn't want to keep going down to la to get the stuff and i'm like you know i went down there I, so basically what happens after survivor the first time i went to survivor like i lost like 20 pounds on the show i came yeah. back and i just like ate everything i went to costco i just like filled up my fridge with costco stuff 
and I just ate it every day. I was like, oh, this stuff doesn't fit my fridge. I better just eat it now. You know, I, I gained uh, 40 pounds, I think, in the first month or two. So I, I lost 20 pounds on the show. I came back, gained 20 pounds, and gained like another 20 pounds. And after a while, I'm like, oh, this is not good for me. <laughs> I'm like, this is, yeah. I, I'm killing myself. So I started looking for food that was yummy, but healthy. I couldn't find it. Like most of the stuff out there was just not very good for you. So I went yeah. down to LA and like, you know, I tried this frozen yogurt, I tried the pink berry stuff and this thing called red mango. And I was like, oh, I love this stuff. This is so good. And I find myself just making excuses to go to LA just to eat the yogurt. <laughs> I'm like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> what am I doing? And then um, one day I met the CEO of red mango and he was like, yeah, we want to expand. And like, and I'm like, hey, when are you going to expand to the Bay Area? Because that's where I live. He's like, well, I don't know. You want to help us? I'm like, okay. So I became the first franchisee and I opened, I think, the second store and I ended up opening a bunch of stores in the Bay Area just because I wanted to eat the yogurt. My, my lesson learned from that is, um, you know, it's good to eat frozen yogurt, but the business of frozen yogurt is a completely different thing. And making decisions with your stomach is probably not a good idea. <laughs> That was like the most <laughs> impulse business decision I've ever. Yeah, that was that that um, was not then, one of uh, the happy experiences of my life. You talked about working so much. You're involved with so many not for profits as well. Like hats off to you. Like what you did with the bone marrow donors and just mm. like raising awareness and how you drove that. I think gave a lot of families uh, ideas on how to find. Um, uh, donors. And I, I think you've like, you have no idea how many lives you probably impacted with that. But what I'm getting to is how do you manage your personal lifetime? Like, do you, uh, have, yeah. do you have to actually like schedule it in like wife, two kids, like what? Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm struggling with this one and I, I'm not a good model here. I've, mm -hmm. it's been hard to find that balance. I think between between working and between family obligations and trying to do the things that you're passionate about that, that matter to you, it's been super hard. And I, yeah, I would say at different times in my life, I've prioritized different things and I felt just terribly guilty about the things that I felt like I wasn't doing enough of. So at one point I decided, you know, I was working a lot and then I need to spend more time with my family. So I want to do that. But then I couldn't do these other things that I care about, whether it's supporting bone marrow drives or other types of you know, Asian American organizations, Korean American organizations. So I pulled back on, you know, so, you know, CKA, the Council of Korean Americans is something that I co-founded. It was again, in the aftermath of the Korean, uh, the, the Virginia Tech massacre. And I felt like, why is it that there isn't a stronger network of Korean Americans where the leaders know each other on a national level? And so I kind of went around the country and I worked with a number of people and we started CKA. And I was very active in that. Like I poured my part of that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then at some point I realized I was not spending enough time with my family. And so then I kind of pulled back from that so I can spend more time with my younger kids. And I'm now kind of at a point where I'm starting to re-engage more. You know, I'm, I'm back on the board of CKA. I'm, and obviously given everything that's happening in the world right now, I, I feel like I, I need to and want to help. But it's hard. It's hard to try to find that balance. And I, I struggle with this every day. Mm. Okay. So I just want to invite our viewers. Um, if you have a question for you, right now is the time to put it into the YouTube comment section because we are wrapping up and I want to make sure that you get your questions asked. Um, okay. So what is the one thing that no one knows about you? <laughs> no, at this point, gosh, like... <laughs> I've been so open about stuff. I, I guess maybe, I don't know, like uh, this is something that lots of people know me who actually know me know, but I, I'm actually a really boring person. I, I feel like, um, I don't know how you call it. I feel like I'm like the Asian Forrest Gump. You know, I just kind of like somehow stumble into one really interesting thing after another, but the reality is I'm actually pretty boring. Like I'm deeply introverted. I don't really like going out. Like it's almost like I can't, when I think that I actually went on a reality show, I'm like, what? Like, that doesn't sound right. Like I'm such a boring guy. Why would, you know, it's almost like I'm thinking about somebody else. Like someone else did that rather than me. Yeah. A brilliant Hollywood idea. I'm a storyteller. Why, why don't you become the Asian forest gun? Like make that. And run across country. Yes. <laughs> run across country. And we will just like weave your Stanford, Yale, survivor, Froyo journey into the movie. And it'll be amazing. Oh, um, anyway, I wanted to talk about you, you know, how you've been, you were talking about how as, as awful as all that's happening uh, against the Asian community right now, how beautiful mm -hmm. it's been to see our community show up. Remember yeah. that grandmother that was beat up so horrific? Yeah. Ago? 
Yeah. Well, I'm sure you already know this, but to our viewers, I mean, there was a GoFundMe for her for hundreds of thousands of dollars, and she's giving it all to fight AAPI causes. Yeah. I mean, talk about yeah. leaving a legacy, right? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. It's extraordinary. It's like I, I think this is really bringing out the best. I mean, you know, you see the worst of people, but you really also see the best of people. I mean, you see acts of courage and generosity and kindness that would not have been seen in you know less difficult circumstances. So it, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of heroes in our community and a lot of sources of inspiration. And it's just remarkable to see this come out. Yeah. No, and it's so many teaching opportunities for our kids, right? You know, yeah. I, I, my son throughout this whole thing, it's, it's just so um, hard for them to understand that their grandparents are in danger, that we are all in danger, just like walking down the street. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I keep, and there's two mantras I give them. I say solve and evolve. Um, and the other one is the difference between struggle and resilience is perspective. Mm. And so mm. how are we going to take this moment and shift our perspective for something greater, right? Um, that's the million dollar question. All right. So I like here's that. that's, good. that's going to happen about our conversation. Um, we are, oh, here's a question from Alvin Lee. What yeah. made you transition from working as an attorney clerk to a managerial position? Uh, yeah, so I went to law school and I, after law school, I worked in different places. I started working at a law firm. Then after 9-11, I wanted to support our country. So I went out to DC and worked for a senator there. Um, and I really liked it. I, I thought maybe working in government and tech policy was the thing that I wanted to do. But I felt like in, in some ways, I wanted to expand my skill set and my experiences. Like as a lawyer, you learn a very powerful way of analyzing things. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought you know, if I want to be a good policymaker, especially in technology, I should probably go work at a technology company to really understand what drives innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I thought would be, you know, in government, you see a lot of people who are lawyers and eventually they work their way up into managing a large organization. But mm -hmm. they haven't necessarily learned the skill set to manage organizations or yeah. to think about industries or markets. And so I thought having that experience would be good. So I ended up switching, uh, going to a management consulting firm where I thought I'd be able to learn those kind of basic skill sets that would let me be more effective later on in my career. See how the sausage is made. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, from there, I ended up working at Google a long time ago um, to get that technology experience. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, one thing that... I'm sorry, my screensaver, this big thing is, I can't see anybody. Um, one piece of advice I'd often give people who are earlier in their careers is that I used to spend most of my career trying to find the dream job, the thing that would give me everything I was looking for. So financial stability, you know, uh, something I'm passionate about in terms of the mission, working with great people and being able to drive impact. And I've always found myself disappointed. I never found all the things that I'm looking for. So I felt like I moved around a lot trying to find that thing. Yeah. And at some point in my career, I realized, you know what? I might never find it. Like, what if I spend my entire career looking for this dream job mm. and, and just disappointed all the time? And at the end of my career, I'll just be like really bummed out. So then I started changing, to your point, my perspective on this. I started thinking, okay, look, I don't know if I'm ever going to find that dream job. Hopefully I will. But maybe if I can think of my career as like a portfolio, as like a set of like different experiences that in the aggregate will allow me to achieve all the things I'm looking for, right? So maybe at any one point in time, I'm not getting everything I want, but like right now I'm optimizing for impact. Right now I'm optimizing for finding a mentor that I really can learn from. Right now I'm optimizing for, you know, financial security. And then over the arc of my life, hopefully I'll be able to hit all the different boxes I'm looking for. That I found to be a really a much better way of looking at my career. So that you know what ends up happening is at one any time my career, I'm like, what are the things that are most important for me right now, and am I finding that? And then in my next thing, what am I looking for? And in doing that, I found a lot more job satisfaction than I think I would have found otherwise. And so that's one thing that I encourage most people listening to really think uh, through in terms of how they look at their own career. Yeah. Um, just to add a little comedy, what did your dad say when you're like, oh, I'm going to go work for a politician in Washington? Like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> my, I think I, you know, my parents, <laughs> my parents, I, I've given them a lot of grief, right? Like, they're like, 
I mean, I mean, if you look at things like I went to, I went on a reality show when. Yeah. So upset. They were like, you know, we kids in this country, we struggle, we put you through good schools. Why would you embarrass us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was, yeah. Uh, you know, the frozen yogurt thing. It was like, what are you doing? <laughs> frozen yogurt. Why aren't you being a lawyer? My parents are my- going to the TV. My, my mom was like, oh, my God, where? <laughs> They're like, what do we do to you? What do we do to you that you're going into TV? Like, why aren't you going to be a lawyer, a doctor, or like an investment banker? It all worked out. <laughs> okay, we have another question from AJ. How has Winning Survivor changed you? Do you think you have had an impact on the Korean community being on TV? Also, being on such a diverse season, how do you feel about the new rule about diversity? So three questions. You don't have to answer all three. Feel free to answer any or all. Uh, How has it changed you, Survivor? Um, Do you think you've had an impact in Korean community? And how do you feel about the new rule regarding diversity on the show? So how did it change me? I think it changed me in the sense that it gave me a lot more confidence. I mean, I was terrified going into that, especially with someone as someone who's so shy and who had these issues, right? Like I didn't like being on, looked at by people, this pariuresis, this shy bladder syndrome. I was so scared that like, what if I go on the show and they're always following me around with the camera and I can't go to the bathroom and I have to reveal on national television in front of everyone that I have this like problem that I've been so ashamed of and hiding my whole life. Like I was terrified going into it, coming out of it. And, but you know, I almost backed out, but I, it's one of those things I thought, look, this, because I'm scared to do this, I have to do it. And I know if I can get through this, it will give me a lot of confidence. I know I'll grow from this experience. And I did. Like going through that experience, I, you know, it wasn't perfect, but I wanted to be able to play a certain way. I didn't want to do something that would, you know, make it harder for people in our community. Um, and so I played a relatively clean game. And I think coming out of it and playing the way that I wanted to play, it just gave me a lot of confidence. I, I knew that I can go through something that scared me so deeply and come out of it okay and come out of it in a way that I felt good about it. Good you about can play it in an honorable way and still win, right? Like you don't have to play dirty. Yay! It's a little bit different, but I can go into that. <laughs> the second part, do I feel like it's helped the career? Yeah. You know, I don't know. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you know, like, you know, it wasn't like saving lives. But I do think it's at least helped chip away at things. You know, it's just one thing along with many other things that I think have allowed us to make progress. Um, I've heard from, you know, a lot of folks who've said like, you know, when I was a kid, I watched you on TV and it helped. It, it, it was nice to see someone who looked like me and it gave me a little bit more confidence that I maybe I could do something like that. So, you know, I think maybe maybe helped a little bit, but, you know, again, it was part of a much broader effort and lots of other people who've ultimately been able to, help us make progress. And then on the last question, I'm not quite sure what the rule on diversity is. I haven't heard about this, so. Yeah. Yeah. Nor have I don't I. Know. Mm. Okay, so I'm gonna tell like a, like, a, like a story and a joke. So this is when you know you are officially a parent. So like, I didn't have going to the bathroom anxiety like you do quite to that degree, but like, you just never want to take a number two in public, you know, like you just, you just try to avoid taking a number two. You you try to strategize your day so that you're doing a number two at home. The minute you become a parent, you can go anywhere because like at home, I always have an audience of one or two people when I'm trying to take care of my business. And so, (laughs) I'm like, oh, so this is when you know you're a parent. Like, I cannot wait to go to the mall. I can't wait to go to work (laughs) so that I can go to the bathroom in peace. (laughs) Oversharing, but you know what? We've been talking for an hour, so I feel like we can all (laughs) stay open with each other. I can talk about bathroom issues all day. Like one of these days, I I actually have this book. I don't have it with me. It's in my room, but there's a book about the best toilets in the world. (laughs) Because of my bathroom obsessions, I've always... And one of these days, I would love to go to the, the cleanest, quietest bathrooms I could possibly find. And personally, I'd find that to be fulfilling. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'll take a nap there. I'll eat a snack. 
I'm just trying to carve out some self-care time these days. <laughs> mommy is hard. Um, okay, so you you keep like saving the world, okay? Because I'm so I'm so proud to that you a exist and b that you afforded this time for us to have this amazing conversation. And um, I know there's a lot of uh, anxious young folks watching who. You know, this is a this is a historic time where the world free froze for an entire year, and yeah. as if like getting out of school and finding a job isn't hard enough, um, you know, we have a year's worth of time of just standstill that you're trying to make up for. But yeah. um, I think if anything, they can take away from our conversation is you can always take one small step per day, yeah. and two, um, be easier on yourself. It's all going to be fine. It's yeah. all going to be fine. And um, anything else you want to add to that, Yur? No, no. I uh, first of all, just thank you for for doing this. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for all the things that you're doing. I can't wait to see your series when it comes out. I mean, it just seems like there's so much nuggets of wisdom. So, and you no, know, thank you also for you know being a trailblazer. I know how hard it is for people to work in entertainment, especially from our community. And you know, like I have no doubt that people seeing you has allowed people growing up to be like, hey, I wanna be like Julie, like this is like someone that I can identify with. So thank you for everything that you've done. I'm, I'm really excited. And you know, hopefully look, everyone hopes that things will be easier for their kids, that they will be able to be more successful than themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm optimistic. Like I really think, you know, as difficult as things are, our kids will be growing up in a better world than one that we grew, grew up in. Yeah, totally. Um, okay. so. The beautiful thing is if you didn't catch our conversation from the very beginning or you want, you found us so riveting that you want to listen to us again, um, this is going to be posted on the Korea Society's YouTube page. So you want to subscribe and so you get all the alerts. So find that on YouTube, Korea Society's YouTube page. And I really appreciate you guys joining me on a Friday. I know COVID life is real and there are other places to be other places to be in your house <laughs> not <laughs> out in the world but you know, around your house no not really we're pretty much out here all day <laughs> i was like let me wait no you don't have anywhere to be <laughs> besides behind your mask um but um hopefully we're turning the corner on that and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel all right everybody thank you for having me as your host bye okay, thanks julie bye 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 everybody stay safe